know who you are. I could tell the minute I saw that big, bulging black bag you were carrying. You're the young person picked by the Marco Polo Travel Society to go with me on a special trip around the world. My name's Jean. I'll be your guide during the trip. We're going to have fun. We'll visit lands where boys and girls wear wide, floppy straw hats to keep off the sun. You'd better bring along your warm mittens and a scarf, too. We're going to visit countries with high mountains where boys and girls go skiing in deep snow almost the whole year round. Got everything you'll need for the trip? Let me see. A yellow toothbrush for the morning, a blue one for before bed, extra socks, two big round apples to nibble on the boat. Good. And all your tickets, pink ones for the ocean liners we'll go on, green ones for the railroad trains, and white ones for the airplanes. Fine. There goes the whistle of our ocean liner. Pick up your bulging black bag and follow me up the gangplank. Our boat's going to sail from the east coast of the United States. For a while, we'll follow the long, crooked coastline of Canada. Canada's a huge country like the United States, with lots of big rivers running down to the ocean. Canadian boatmen row along these rivers, using them as roads to the sea. They sing an old song as they row their boats. <laughs> Faintly as towards the evening chime, our voices keep tune and our oars keep time. Our voices keep tune and our oars keep time. Soon as the woods on shore look dim, we'll sing at St. Anne's our parting hymn. Row, brothers, row, the stream runs fast. The rapids are near and the daylight's past. The rapids are near and the daylight's past. Why should we yet our sail unfurl? There is not a breath, 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 there is not a dream runs fast. The rapids are near and the daylight's past. The rapids are near and the daylight's past. If you look out the porthole now, you'll see miles of fir trees. Canada's a land of great forests. Some of the woodsmen who used to cut down Canada's trees came from the land of France. To reach Canada, they crossed the same ocean we're crossing now, the Atlantic Ocean. Only they came from the other side of it and sailed over to ours. Lots of Canadians still speak the language of France, and they still sing songs in French. They like to sing about Alouette, the pretty little bird with feathers in all colors. <laughs> Gentil alouette, alouette, je te plumerai, je te plumerai la tête, je te plumerai la tête, à la tête, à la tête, oh. Alouette, gentil alouette, alouette, je te plumerai. A gentle little songbird, alouette's feather shall be plucked. I shall pluck them from her head. Je te plumerai la tête, à la tête, alouette. Oh, alouette, gentil alouette, alouette, je te plumerai. Gentil alouette, alouette, je te plumerai. I shall pluck them from her back. Je te plumerai le dos from her back. À la dos, oh. Alouette, gentil alouette, alouette, je te plumerai. Why don't we stroll around the deck of our ship and get some fresh air? We can throw bread to the seagulls flying alongside. 
They may like the bread scraps enough to follow us all the way to Ireland, our first stop across the sea. Here's a piece of bread for you, Miss Seagull. Swoop down and catch it before it reaches the waves. Good catch, Miss Seagull. No matter how big your boat is, the ocean can still be bumpy. Hang on for the next wave. Up we go again, and down. Bump, splash. Marco Polo himself would have enjoyed this. Marco Polo was a great traveler who long ago made a trip all the way to India and China, going by sailboat, on foot, by horseback, camelback, and for all I know, even by piggyback. He was a bold man, extra bold, because in those days, people thought that the world was flat. They were afraid to journey far from home for fear they'd come to the edge of the earth and fall off. What an idea. Nowadays, of course, we know that the world is round, like a ball. If we travel around it in a great circle, we can come back to where we started from. Try it with an apple. If you run your finger along the widest part of the apple, you'll soon be right back at the spot where you started. But the world is a very, very big apple. I wonder how soon we'll sight Ireland. Six days at sea without a sign of land. But now look over there. There's Ireland. The Emerald Isle, as the Irish call it, because it's an island full of lovely green hills and meadows that shine as bright as emeralds in the soft sunlight. A gentle rain often falls to help keep the fields green. Rocks in Ireland look very gray, and cottages with little chimneys look very white. The west wind from the sea blows across the land, bringing gentle rains to the towns and villages of Ireland. The children here love to sing about a man who tried to grow a beard until the wind came up and blew his whiskers in again. There was an old man called Michael Finnegan. He grew whiskers on his chin again. The wind came up and blew them in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. There was an old man called Michael Finnegan. He went fishing with a Finnegan. Caught a fish, but dropped it in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. There was an old man called Michael Finnegan. Climbed a tree and barked his shin again. Took off several yards of skin again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. The Irish people love talking. They call it having the gift of gab when somebody can use words that skip about and dance. The Irish love talking to the neighbors almost as much as they love talking to strangers. They speak a bit differently from Americans. My grandmother came from Ireland. Once I heard an American lady ask her whether it was best to say either or either when speaking to somebody. Neither is right, said my grandmother. It's either. As any young Irish boy will tell you, St. Patrick drove the snakes from the Emerald Isle forever, and Ireland now has no snakes at all. It's altogether unhappy the Irish should be if it hadn't been for good St. Patrick. They tell of one very large and slippery snake that St. Patrick had trouble driving away. Sure, and I'll be back on Monday, Patrick promised, for the snake had squirmed into a deep lake. But Patrick forgot to come back probably because he had so many good deeds to do. And to this day, every Monday, so the people who live by the lake say, the big old slippery snake rises to the top of the lake and calls in a loud voice, It's been a long Monday, Patrick. Michael and Patrick are popular names for Irish boys. Kathleen and Bridget are favorite names for girls. The nickname for Patrick is Paddy. The Irish love their land, but they also enjoy traveling to the strange and far-off places of the world. When they sail far away, their parents and friends at home miss them very much. That's what happened when a boy named Paddy Riley went a-wandering. The home folks even sang a tune about how much they wanted Paddy Riley to come back. <laughs> Come back, Paddy Riley, to Bally Jim's stuff. 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 Come back,
Paddy Riley to me Come back, Paddy Riley to Bally Jim Stuff Come back, Paddy Riley to me Another bumpy boat ride will take us across the Irish Sea to the west of England. England is a green land surrounded by water, just as Ireland is. We'll drive by bus to a place called Northumberland, where farmers and fisherfolk live. The towns around here have strange-sounding names like Wooler, Hexham, and Halt Whistle. But we're going to visit Newcastle, where Bobby Shafto came from. The Shaftos are a well-known family in Newcastle. Just like you and me, Bobby Shafto was a traveler who often went to sea. The girl who loved him wasn't happy till after he came back and married her, wearing silver buckles on his knee breeches. <laughs> your next ticket ready. We're going to sail north from Newcastle on another boat to Norway, land of the midnight sun. Norway is a long, narrow land with lots of steep, snow-covered mountains coming right down to the sea, the deep green sea. Part of Norway lies far to the north, near the top of the world. In summertime, the days grow very, very long in this part of the world. So very long, in fact, that the sun shines all during the night as well as during the day. That's why we call Norway the land of the midnight sun. In the wintertime, though, Norway has very dark days with hardly any sun at all. How eagerly the people of Norway await the summer sunlight during their long, dark winters. The sun means a lot to the Norwegians. The sun and the sea. Hundreds of fishing boats move up and down the coast of Norway, filling their nets with shiny silver fish. So many Norwegians have become sailors that they've made Norway a great sea-going country. Once every year in the month of May, Norwegians celebrate their day of freedom. In the capital city of Oslo, children march through the streets, carrying Norwegian flags and their school banners. The children march to the royal palace where the king greets them. The long winter is over. The crowd smiles. The king smiles right back at them, and even the sun seems to be smiling as it takes almost forever to set behind the hills. The sun glows orange, then pink, and at last purple as it disappears from sight. Then the fireworks begin. Magical bursts of silver and gold and violet fire fill the night sky. Everybody oohs and ahs as each new rocket climbs high and bursts open in bright colors, like the petals of a huge flower opening in the sky. Then the boys and girls throng around old Pear, the fiddler. They beg him to fiddle a tune. Pear's eyes twinkle. For a moment, he pretends that he doesn't want to play that day. What, the children shout, not play on our freedom day? Well, all right. A tune or two, says Pear, his face wrinkling with a big smile. You good old violin, you, Pear says to his fiddle, do your duty well. 
pear traded his only cow for that violin when he was a young man. And he loves it so much now he wouldn't trade it back for ten cows. Instead, he tucks it under his chin and begins to scrape out his favorite tune. Per Spelliman had had a hainaste coo. Per Spelliman had had a hainaste coo. An buet tabort coolia fect fela in yen. An buet tabort coolia fect fela in yen. Tu gamle gore fiolindu fiolindu fela mi. The fiddler pair he on just one single cow. The fiddler pair he on just one single cow. He traded his one cow for a fiddle fine. He traded his one cow for a fiddle fine. You old and trusty violin, you violin, you friend of mine. When Pear grows so old, he must rest in the shade. When Pear grows so old, he must rest in the shade. His fiddle for ten cows, he still will not trade. His fiddle for ten cows, he still will not trade. You old and trusty violin, you violin, you friend of mine. In almost every land, young people hear about fairy creatures who live deep in the forests. If you tiptoe through the trees of a Norwegian forest and keep very still all the while, you may be lucky enough to discover a band of trolls dancing together in a ring. Trolls are tiny men with funny red noses. They wear large floppy caps on their heads. Yet even while they dance and hop about on their short jumpy legs, those floppy caps never fall off. Some people say the trolls can do all sorts of magic things, such as fill up a little gold thimble with milk. And then if you try to drink from the thimble, no matter how long you drink or even gulp, the thimble stays full of milk. Ah, but if you do come across a band of trolls dancing in a ring, be careful not to make a sound. If you breathe too loud or step on a branch, all the trolls will vanish in an instant the forest will be emptier than ever. We can visit deep, silent forests in the land of Sweden, too. Sweden is Norway's next-door neighbor. But if you hear music in the midst of a Swedish forest, don't count on its being troll music. You see, Swedish people love to wander outdoors just as much as their Norwegian neighbors. And when they wander over hills, through woods and fields, they love to sing. <laughs> Den kaverk faller av Som låner av smaragderna Sin färg haller av Sorger har vi inga vara glada Vi sår klinga när vi går Över dags den kaverk faller av We'll go over bright shining hills Faller av While on the grass the morning sunshine spills Faller av Troubles aren't worth bringing So we raise our voices singing As we stroll over bright shining hills Faller av Sweden is a rich land, with lots of iron beneath the ground, as well as its millions of trees from which they make paper and matchsticks and wooden tables and dolls and toys and lots of other things. Swedish dolls are apt to have blonde hair and very blue eyes, just like so many Swedish boys and girls. Well, I wish we could stay longer in this part of the world. Folks call these the Scandinavian countries, for both Norway and Sweden belong to a northern part of the world called Scandinavia. It's been fun visiting these friendly people, but now we're off by airplane to Moscow, the capital city of Russia, the largest country in the whole world. Get your first white ticket ready from your ticket book. From the airplane window, look down on the hugeness of Russia. Yellow 
fields and winding rivers go on nearly forever. We can see enormous forests, too, and mountains, and broad fields of grass and wheat. The city of Moscow has a new underground railway, but to me the old buildings are just as interesting. Old towers stand in various parts of Moscow, red and pale green, towers with funny shapes that look almost like giant onions and pineapples, and strawberries even. Close to Moscow flows the Volga, a river that winds clear across Russia. Even before motorboats were invented, boatmen used to move loads of things on the river. Their boats moved in the water, but the men walked along the banks on dry land and pulled the boats after them. They tugged on heavy ropes as they walked along and sang in time to each long tug. summer is hot. The Russian winter is cold. A cold, long winter of biting winds. Rivers freeze into ice. To make the winter time pass quickly, people used to hold great fairs. There was dancing and racing. People drank bowls of hot cabbage soup and traded leather shoes and bags or bought dolls for the children. The best of all were the ice hills. People built hills of ice and decorated the sides with pine trees. Then they'd clear a smooth path down one side of the ice hill and far out across the frozen river. Boys and girls would sit down on metal trays and slide down the sides of the ice hills far out over the river. Sometimes they went fast enough to slide clear to the top of another ice hill. If they didn't go that far, there were ladders in back so they could climb to the top of the next hill. At last the spring thaw comes. Ice in the rivers begins to crack, then it melts and rushes away. Snow goes away from the land. The slender birch trees no longer bend under ice and snow. Ivan, the young woodcarver from the village across the river, goes out to look for a likely piece of wood. One small, graceful birch tree catches his eye. Its silvery white trunk means more to him than all the other trees in the forest. Ivan decides he'll carve a balalaika from the wood. A balalaika is a musical instrument that sounds a lot like a guitar. <laughs> Ch- 
among the wispy white clouds back into the very heart of Europe. We're in the land of Austria now. We'll get on board a mountain railroad train and take a trip through high mountains covered with snow. They're called the Alps. Got your bulging black bag and one or two more apples to munch? Yes, and one of those apples looks as round as the world we're going around. Hop on board then. Give your green train ticket to the conductor. The man in the peaked cap. Right now, our train's being pulled by a steam engine. Later on, when we reach the Alps, we'll change over to a powerful electric engine. Let me rub some of the mist away from the train window so we can take a look at Austria. Ah, watch the bubbling stream running through a tiny village. The houses are white, and the village church has a round tower on top shaped just like an onion. Such towers are called onion towers for that very reason. As we near the Alps, the land gets steeper and stonier. Red deer and brown rabbits live in the forests below the mountains. Our trains change to an electric engine. We'll glide up the steep track around the mountain slopes and back without any huffing and puffing. Ahead of us, poking up through the clouds, are the stony Alps of Switzerland. There's a young Swiss boy near the track wearing high woolen stockings, a leather vest, and a red cap with a tassel on top. He's leading five great big brown cows to their pasture high up in the mountains. Look, the boy's hanging a ribbon of pink and blue mountain flowers around the first cow's neck. She must be his favorite. And there's a big bell dangling from the same cow's neck. Did you ever try to yodel? That's how folk in the Alps call back and forth across the valleys to one another. A yodel sounds something like this. yodel hee hee Another way to signal far across a valley is to blow a few notes on an Alp horn. Imagine a wooden pipe for smoking, only make it a huge, long pipe, big enough for a giant, with a big, wide-open bowl at one end. That's what an Alp horn looks like. When a shepherd in the mountains wants to make music that can be heard all around by all the neighbors, he'll sound the alp horn. He raises the smaller end of the long horn to his lips and blows hard into it. The sound pours out of the big open bowl at the other end. You have to really blow hard, not huff and puff, if you want to make a musical message move across the mountains. Many of the people in Switzerland and Austria speak the language of Germany, the land to the north. But in the sunny south of Switzerland, the people speak the language of Italy. In springtime, when the snow in the mountains begins to melt, these mountaineers of the south eagerly wait for the sound of the cuckoo. 
When they hear this bird singing in the trees, they know that the winter's over and warm weather's coming back. Passato l'aprile non c'è più, è ritornato il maggio al canto del cucù. Cucù, cucù, l'aprile non c'è più, è ritornato il maggio al canto del cucù. Cucù, cucù, l'aprile non c'è più, è ritornato il maggio al canto del cucù. Cold winter now has vanished and April's gone by too. All in the merry month of May sings a sweet cuckoo. Cuckoo, cuckoo, for April's gone by too. All in the merry month of May sings a sweet cuckoo. Cuckoo, cuckoo, for April's gone by too. All in the merry month of May sings a sweet cuckoo. We've come down out of the Alps. Instead of white snow and gray stone, there are bright red flowers everywhere and green palm trees standing in parks alongside lakes that are warm and blue. We're in sunny Italy now. Our train's fast approaching the seaside city of Venice. When a boy in Venice named Luigi sets out for school in the morning, he packs up his books and pencils just as boys and girls do all over the world. At the front door, he waves goodbye to his mother. But Luigi doesn't walk to school. He doesn't go by bus or by subway. He goes by boat, a long, narrow black boat called a gondola. So do most of the other boys and girls, because there aren't any streets in the city of Venice, or at least not streets as you and I know them. Between the houses, instead of regular streets, Venice has canals. If you want to visit your neighbors or buy some bread, you go by gondola. As your boat whispers its way along the watery streets, you have to duck sometimes when you pass under a low bridge. There are no automobiles and buses in Venice, no trucks and trolleys. When the firemen in Venice go to a fire, they go to the fire in boats too. There's always plenty of water around to help put out the fire. Just drop your tin pail down into the street and pull up a pail full of water. Not a gondola, but another big ocean liner will take us away from Venice. We're going to follow the rocky coast of Yugoslavia for a while. We'll see gray rocks or green trees going down to the sea. Ivo is the name of a Yugoslavian boy who often sails out from shore in a fishing boat made of wood. Ivo's boat is very small and much wider around than a gondola. It looks something like a nutshell bobbing about in the ocean, but the waves won't tip it over. Ivo's sister, Maritza, has painted two great blue eyes along the bow of Ivo's boat up in front. These two blue eyes are for good luck, she told Ivo. Your boat will see where it's going at night. You won't bump into rocks or other boats now. Ivo laughed and thanked Maritza for painting the two eyes on his boat. Ivo knows, though, that he'll have to keep his own eyes open as well. Often he sails far away from his home village by the sea. When he thinks of his mother and sister and his home by the sea, he sings this song. <laughs>
The people of Yugoslavia are friendly to strangers. When it's time to say goodbye, they say Dovigenia, which really means they hope you'll come back for a longer visit someday. Dovigenia, Ivo. Dovigenia, Maritza. How blue the water is around the islands of Greece, the next land on our journey. The further we sail, the fewer green plants we see growing on land. Scarcely a drop of water falls from above on some of the Greek islands. A hot sun bakes them brown. They look like huge lions crouching in the blue water. From a distance, the white houses of the villages look like white sugar cubes piled on top of each other. In each village is a taverna, a tiny restaurant where you may walk through the dining room, straight out into the kitchen, and point out to the cook just what you'd like to have for dinner. Back in the dining room, the village musician has appeared. While you eat, he'll strum a tune for you. The sun gets hotter and hotter, sparkling on the sea. We're sailing on to Africa now. We're going ashore in the land of Egypt to visit an outdoor marketplace called a bazaar. Come along. What a lot of noise. What a hubbub in the bazaar. Merchants are selling red and yellow carpets, greenish blue beads, and shiny copper pots. The musicians over there are Arabs who've come in from the desert. Most of this part of the world is sandy desert. All you can see is stones and sand, and more sand. The Arabs wear long flowing robes and open sandals on their feet. For a hat, each Arab wears a white cloth over his head fastened with a bright red cord. It's called a burnoosh, and it's cool because it hangs a bit loose. Maybe it looks like a pillowcase, but it's cool, and oh, I'm hot. The way Arabs dress, they know how to beat the heat best. With buttons and bows or covered up toes, you and I are much too warmly dressed. Oh, still, we might as well get used to the heat for our next boat stop will be in another land that's hot, the great land of India. One part of India is quite cool, where the highest mountains in the whole world reach to the top of the sky. Hardly anybody lives there. But on the hot plains of India live millions and millions and more millions of people. There seem to be people everywhere. Indians are brave, friendly people. Life is hard for many of them. The little elephant boy, or Mahout, must work from dawn till dusk to earn the rice and meal he eats for supper. A Mahout's job is to sit atop an elephant and give orders to the elephant. For you see elephants doing lots of work in India. Elephants are beloved pets but they're also taught to pull heavy things and to lift logs with their large curly trunks. An elephant marching by with its trunk wrapped around a gigantic log takes up an elephant-sized part of the road. The dusty little mahout sitting on the elephant's back grins cheerfully. His teeth are as white as the white cloth wrapped around his head. I don't mind if the road is dusty, the sun is hot, he says. I have my big gray elephant for a friend, and at the end of a hard day, there'll be a singing lady in robes of gold and blue who'll dance in my village. She'll sing a song about the roads where I travel with my elephant.
And now we're off to Hong Kong, another part of Asia, which is what we call this part of the world. All Asia depends on rain to help grow food for its millions and millions of people. From April till the month of September, skies are gray and the air is hot and sticky. Sudden winds and rainstorms come along. They call that the monsoon season. People pray for enough rain to let the rice grow in the paddies, the fields where rice is planted. This year there's been enough rain, luckily. The rice paddies are quite muddy places. Wa Ki, a Chinese boy who lives near the city of Hong Kong, works in the paddies alongside his sister Li, picking the rice. They've both taken off their shoes and their legs are bare. Picking rice is muddy work. Shlup, shlup, says the mud, grabbing their feet with every step. Waki and Lee wear wide straw hats that come to a point on top. Once a year, when the work's all done, a special day comes for Waki and his sister. It's called the Feast of the High Places. The entire family packs up a picnic lunch and carries it to the top of a mountain. And everyone brings along at least one kite. At lunchtime, Lee is allowed to cut the cake. What a cake it is! A special cake nine layers high. After the nine layer cake's eaten, the whole family, mother, father, grandfather and the children, begin to fly their kites. High in the air they sail. Kites in the shape of flowers and birds, and one enormous one, green and red, which looks just like a dragon sticking out its red tongue. The dragon kites so big and tugs so hard in the wind that it takes both father and grandfather and then walk he to hold the string. There's a small kite, too, strung with shiny metal wires. This kite plays music in the wind as though it were a strange harp being plucked. After the kite flying is over, the family sits in a circle with their musical instruments. Lee plays a cymbal. Grandmother smiles proudly and nods in time to grandfather's instrument, a tiny drum that looks like a water jug. Then father tells a story. Once, long ago, a great Chinese general named Han was losing a battle to his enemies. At night, he ordered that 100 kites be strung with shiny wires and then floated in the night wind by his men over the camp of the sleeping enemy. When the enemy heard the wind playing in the wires of the 100 kites, they didn't know what to think. The strange sound in the air frightened them. They began to believe it was the wind saying to them, Fu Han, Fu Han. That meant, beware of Han, beware of General Han. Then all the enemy fled, leaving their swords and shields and spears behind. Because of his 100 kites, General Han won the battle after all. And now we're going for a short visit to Japan a crowded land of islands off the coast of China. There's a constant hustle and bustle in Japan. Besides fishing and growing rice, the people make silk and cotton cloth in great mills. Children have a wonderful time in Japan. So many things are made extra small, so they're just the right size for children. In the parks, you see real trees that hardly come up to your waist and the Japanese have midget deer scarcely higher than your knee. Houses are small too, with very low ceilings and doorways. You'll find cushions to sit on instead of chairs. Japanese rooms are really small, and that's the way the Japanese want them, because usually they themselves aren't very tall. The blue Pacific Ocean is an enormously big sea. It takes up more room than all of the world's land put together. But now, sailing along the Pacific, we're going to visit the Hawaiian Islands. Fresh pineapples by the millions and friendly people by the thousands 
help make the Hawaiian Islands one of the nicest places I know. Hawaii is the newest state of the United States, though it's far, far away from the mainland of America. When a visitor comes to the islands, the Hawaiians hang chains of flowers around his neck and kiss him on both cheeks. When he has to go away again, they sing an old song of farewell. Each part of the world says farewell in its own way. In Hawaii, they say aloha oi. Our neighbors in Latin America like to say, Buenos dias. It's their way of saying hello. Many boys and girls learn to play the guitar or violin in South America. And in the land of Venezuela, they like to greet you with a song. Listen to one girl tell how she spent some copper coins very wisely. Our trip around the world's nearly over. Just one more land to visit before we get home. We're going back by way of Mexico. Mexico lies just south of the United States. It's a land full of sunshine, green cactus plants, and purple hills. Pedro rides his little donkey down one of the hills into town. He wears a big straw hat, his sombrero, to keep off the sun. Ay, he thinks to himself, there's going to be a fiesta today, a carnival with clowns and dancing and carts full of candy. Merchants will sell beautiful things of silver and leather, too. And as Pedro rides into town, he hears the silversmith still tapping away with his hammer, 
making one last bowl for the fiesta. Everyone's going to the fiesta, or everyone but the tiny little cockroach, La Cucaracha. According to the Mexican song, La Cucaracha can't go to the fiesta because he doesn't have any cigars. Perhaps La Cucaracha doesn't care for singing and dancing, but Pedro does, and so does the rest of the world. Cuando uno quiera una, y es una no lo quiere, es lo mismo que si un cargo, en la calle encuentro un cero. La cucaracha, la cucaracha, ya no quieres caminar, porque no tienes, porque le falta cigarrillo que fumar. Las muchachas son de oro, las casanas son de plata, las viudas son de cobre y las viejas hojas de lata. La cucaracha, la cucaracha, ya no quieres caminar, porque no tienes, porque le falta cigarrillo.